I got to admit that whenever myself and some of the other former fire staff here at Bandelier were asked to do a presentation as part of this staff ride, we had some, some real mixed feelings. On one hand, we were being asked to open the book to the perhaps darkest chapter in our lives, and that's kind of a hard thing to do. But on the other hand, we were really motivated by the fact that if our presentations could keep even one of you guys from having to go down the road that we did and deal with everything that we dealt in the aftermath of Cerro Grande, it would be more than worthwhile. Welcome to Station 1 of the Staff Ride. I really hope you have a very productive learning experience. The Staff Ride is sort of set up like chapters of a book. And this Station 1 is the introductory chapter. And what I'm going to try to do here is just set the scene and the context for the Cerro Grande prescribed fire. I want to talk about a couple previous significant fire events that sort of shaped the thinking in this area. Uh, talk about the overview of the interagency setting and the park organization discuss a few key aspects of the fire management plan and other activities that occurred during the fall, winter, spring prior to the Cerro Grande prescribed fire. And the first prescribed fire that was conducted at Bandelier was in uh, the fall of 1978. That was a year after the La Mesa fire. And the La Mesa fire was the first large fire that occurred on Bandelier. And in fact, the first large fire that spread onto the lab, threatened the laboratory facilities in the town of Los Alamos. That was a human-caused fire that was started on June 16, 1977. And if you look out across here, if you look at the kind of the, the burn scars on those mesas, that was the La Mesa fire. Came from the west to the east, blew across here, blew across the park, when it entered the laboratory, and it was just a stroke of good fortune that no laboratory facilities were, were burned during that, that episode. Um, I was told that, that that fire was the first time that ICS was used in the Southwest, of was 1977. So that's kind of what, one of the things that made it significant. And uh, what is interesting about that is that even though it spread onto the lab, threatened facilities, for whatever reason, it didn't serve as a wake-up call to the uh, land management agencies, to the laboratory or the community that, you know, we're at risk here. I'm not really sure why that is, and talking with some of the old timers, they sort of talked about, well, the next few years after that were weather than normal, not much fire activity, and it just seemed to uh, uh, pass from people's minds. Let's fast forward to 1996 and the Dome Fire, which was the second large fire that Bandelier experienced, uh, and uh, that was another human caused start, started on Santa Fe National Forest land, spread onto the park, and had great potential to enter Upper Frijoles Canyon, run through that, and threaten the laboratory and the town site. And it was only the success of a pretty dicey burnout operation that prevented that from happening. The 1996 uh, Dome Fire was a significant wake-up call. Folks recognized at this point that, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. We do have a fuels problem. The laboratory is vulnerable. The town site is vulnerable. And we have to do something about that. 
There was also some recollections back to the 78 La Mesa fire. They're going, boy, that burned kind of similar to the Dome fire. This has happened more than once. We're not going to continue to be lucky. And then during the time period between 1996, the Dome fire, and 2000, Bandelier conducted 10 prescribed fire projects uh, totaling nearly 6,000 acres. The primary focus of those projects were improving the defensibility of the park and lab boundary and to reducing hazardous fuels around some of the key park facilities, residential areas, campgrounds, visitor centers, those types of things. A significant driver of the park's fire management program was data from extensive fire history study that was done throughout the Hamas Mountains. Tom Swettenham, Craig Allen, and a number of others were, were involved in that. And basically what the fire return was, but pre-1900, the mean fire return interval ranged from five to 25 years throughout the Hamas Mountains. Generally, that shorter return interval was associated with lower to mid-elevation ponderosa pine, and the longer return interval was a higher elevation mixed conifer. And then the fire history basically ended in 1890. They couldn't really find any, any fire scars after that time period. This was initially due to some changing land, land use patterns, i.e. a whole lot of sheep grazing during that 1890s, early 1900s. And then, you know, as, as it evolved and fire suppression also had its hand in, in ending that uh, fire record. As we got into the early mid 90s, they were doing a better job of looking at the fire scar on the growth ring and determining the seasonality of the fire activity. And the information they came up with was that 56% of the natural fires occurred during the spring months, 38% during the summer, and only 6% during the fall. And prior to that time, the primary prescribed fires were being conducted here during the fall months. But with this information, plus we had some data from fire effects monitoring plots, while by no means comprehensive, it at least suggested that there may be some issues with non-native and exotic species associated with the fall burn. Because of those two things, we began shifting our prescribed fire program to try to take advantage of spring burn windows whenever possible. Upper Frijoles Canyon was a keystone to our fire management program. That's the canyon that during the 1977 La Mesa fire, the fire crossed that canyon in spreading through the park and onto the lab lands. And then in the 1996 Dome fire, in 1997 Loomis Wildland Fire Use, a great deal of time and effort and concern was keeping these fires out of Upper Frijoles because that served as a major pathway. Once it got fire got in there, it posed a serious threat to the town site and to the laboratory. And in fact, you'll have a chance to see it when you go from here to stand two. Once you get up the road another mile or so, off to your left, you'll see a very large, deep canyon, steep, rugged, densely vegetated, hasn't seen any fire since the late 1890s. Around 1995, a prescribed burn plan was prepared for that unit, Unit 9. And uh, in my arrival, the more I looked at that plan and the more I looked at that canyon and walked around, the less comfortable I was is, is, is my ability to be a burn boss to be able to pull that thing off. But we were very fortunate to have someone at the caliber of Paul Gleason in our Intermountain Regional Office. So in the fall of 97, I talked to Paul, set him the burn plan, he and I talked about it for a while, and he agreed to be the burn boss for Unit 9. And that was the only reason that he was actually here in the spring of 2000 for Cerro Grande he wanted to come down, do an on-site review of Unit 9 before he revised the burn plan for that. And he hoped to be down here when there was actually fire on the ground from a prescribed fire or, or, or suppression activity so he could see burning conditions firsthand. There were two other burn units that were located upslope and downwind of Unit 9. That's Unit 1 and 5 that ultimately became the Cerro Grande fire. And it was apparent that you could not put any fire into Unit 9 until you treated those lands that were upslope and downwind. This talk just a little bit about the weather and what was going on there. During the fall and winter of 99, 2000, it was much drier than normal in here below normal precip. But as we started getting into mid-March into mid-April, we got increased precipitation. And during that one month period, 
An on-site uh, weather station located on a burn unit measured almost an inch and a half of precipitation during that month. That included a 16-inch snowfall on Cerro Grande. But because of that snow and the precip, our, our plans to do the burn in April had to be put on hold. The, the unit was simply too wet to get anything accomplished. But by mid-May, I mean, excuse me, mid-April, there were prescribed burns being conducted at the lower to mid elevations. On April 24th, Santa Fe National Forest conducted a burn south of White Rock, the community you passed on the way, way in. And then on April uh, 25th, Bandelier ignited Unit 40, which is 350 acres around the headquarters campground residence area. And both of those burns were successful. No extreme fire behavior was observed. No significant uh, holding problems were encountered either on the Park Service burn or the Forest Service burn. On the afternoon and evening of April 28th, a little system came through and it was a, 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 a little dry lightning bust that resulted in a half a dozen or so uh, new starts right in the Cerro Grande vicinity, kind of that higher elevation, 8,500 to 9,500 feet. Some of the initial attack actions were delayed because it occurred late on the 28th, didn't get resources out to the 29th. But in spite of that delayed initial attack, all the IA actions were successful. All of those fires were suppressed at less than an acre, except one that went to four acres before being contained. And again, no extreme fire behavior or anything was observed. So based on what we saw in the previous burns just a week earlier, and what we saw at the higher elevations during the initial attack activities, it seemed to indicate that there was a low probability of having extreme fire behavior on uh, the Cerro Grande unit if we were gonna ignite that in the next few days. On May 3rd, touch, touch bases with Mike Powell. Mike, everything sounded good for Cerro Grande as a go. One issue that he did have was a uh, Forest Service employee he had lined up to be the holding boss, wasn't available to another assignment. He asked if I'd be able to assist in that capacity, and I said yes. On the morning of the 4th, went into the office, checked the situation report. There was one type one incident on, in Arizona in the southwest. There was some scattered initial activity, initial attack activity, but nothing other really substantial going on. The preparedness level for the southwest was in preparedness level three at that time, and that meant there were no restrictions on prescribed fire activity. So later on in the day, I, Paul Gleason was here, met with Paul, we went out and did a recon on the ground of burn unit nine, and then later on in the day, we tied in with prescribed fire folks and headed on up to the burn unit. And so with that, that's the end of the introductory chapter. Again, you'll learn more about the prescribed burn plan and other things in the next stations. So hopefully I've adequately set the scene for you. And at this point, let's open it up for questions. Al, Al was, was this the most <coughs> comprehensive in scale prescribed fire plan that you guys, that, or that the park had had? In other words, that many phases, that many units, that many acres, over that many years, was that was was this the the big one, so to speak? No, or the, the ones prior had equal in landscape, equal in complexity, equal in duration, et cetera. Yeah, prior to 1976 that, or 1996, that wouldn't have been true. But around 96, there was an effort to try to you know instead of doing 200 acres or 400, of trying to get larger units. And there were several thousand acre, I mean, you know, two or three thousand acre burns that were done 1996 through 99. So there were others of similar size, duration, that type of thing. And they were fall? Or no, they were, they were spring burns. Spring burns also. Yeah. Yeah, once we started getting that new, that new information and started shifting to the, the, to the spring burn window, I think we only did one fall burn, maybe from 97 to 2000. The rest were all spring. What I'm here to talk to you guys about is the development of the burn plan, uh, fuels, weather, and prescription. At the time of project initiation, as I said, I was scheduled to be the ignition specialist. I was fully qualified in that capacity and had run about uh, somewhere between 25 and 35 operational periods as a type two ignition specialist at that point, um, mostly in the Southwest, but some in the Northwest. The 
prescribed fire project area represents about a thousand acres. A uh, couple lines on this map are a little misdrawn. This eastern flank actually drops through this meadow and then parallels the existing northeastern boundary that you see on the map. And if you turn around, you look at this, this false summit right behind you is this knob and the montane grasslands, the actual summit of Cerro Grande is the far peak that you can see the tree wall standing just on the skyline with the grasslands underneath it. The unit was going to be treated in three phases. Phase one was burning in these montane grasslands. This was going to be, and as you look at this, phase one and two um, essentially represent a black lining operation. Um, phase one to treat the montane grasslands in the top what we were going to do up there, burn that at night, um, put the back edge of it out to establish a black line along the top of the unit. Phase two would have brought fire down the flanks of the unit. Uh, there was a saw cut coming off of this meadow, tied into some old roads that are very grown over now. We opened some of those roads back up only for holding lines. We didn't, this is wilderness. We did not want to use vehicles off the roads anywhere in the park. Um, that's consistent with the resource management plan in the park. Um, so saw cut established down through here. Phase two would have black lined both sides of the unit. Phase three would have been a final after a black line's established burning out the interior in these Aspen communities and um, some of the heavier fuel model eight. Uh, this could have taken place, oh, the way we'd written the plan could have taken place over a period of weeks, perhaps as much as a month, month and a half, depending on seasonal conditions. We'd written the plan to allow us to go up into those montane grasslands as soon as snow came off them. Even if we had snow in the spruce forest underneath, if we still had drift snow in there, we were gonna get up there and do some burn and felt like we could hold on to it real well. Um, with night burning, we were just gonna, as I said, establish a black line, um, put the back edge of it out with backpack pumps, uh, hand tools, and spruce boughs. And we had the best luck with spruce boughs when we did it. Mike will talk more about that during operations. We had taken two of the module members from the Bandelier Fire Use Module, put them up on the hill until about 2,200 hours on the night of the third to collect data for requesting a spot weather forecast the next day. Within that, Mike Powell called Chuck Maxwell, who was the forecaster that we worked with a lot at the National Weather Service, at the National weather Service office, asked him if the models he was looking at were showing him that the next night would be, repre would be well represented, represented by weather that we were pulling that night. Spot weather forecast was requested at 11.35 on the day of the 4th, and we got it back. Everything looked go. Morning of the burn, we made our phone contacts. I made about 26 phone calls that day. Um, called everybody from Cochiti Pueblo to the Santa Fe Forest to our local cooperators, the BACA, State ADQ. Um, we checked on the availability contingency resources. Knew there was a tanker sitting on the runway in uh, Albuquerque. Um, we knew that Sandia Hell Attack was sitting on the pad at Tijeras. Um, I actually checked specifically on the Santa Fe shots. They were in station and not committed. Um, and there was another Type 2 crew available from the BIA within the area. We were told that all contingency resources could be delivered within our time frames. Can you just show me where in the phase two where the hand line where the went down? There's there was as I said there was a saw cut established yep. from the edge of this meadow that bounded the burn unit. Again, this is incorrectly drawn. Right. It actually came off like okay. this. Yep. Saw cut tied these roads in, yep. and the plan was just to keep as we after we got that saw cut in, we were going to keep up with building hand line as needed, check line as needed, as we burnt down oh, okay. through this fuel model eight. Yeah. There was no scrape yeah. put in, but there was a sizable cut. There was a risk analysis done. There was a complexity rating sheet done. At the time, as you'll recall, we didn't have a standard. Um, there were about three complexity analyses out there. 
The one that Mike elected to use was the one that uh, Rocky Mountain National Park had been having pretty good luck with. It's here and available if any of you want to look at it. Um, and looking back on them now, they're all pretty awkward documents. And I really feel like one of the good things that came out of all of this was we have a much better system to plan within now. You know, it's, it's across the board, standardized. I think it's a pretty good system and it's a lot easier to use than it used to be. I mean, some of the stuff, frankly, that we had to work with at the time was kind of voodoo. Quick introduction, I'm Mike Powell. I was a burn boss on this fire. Um, my position at uh, Bandelier at the time was as I was uh, temporarily promoted into the assistant fire management officer. Uh, my normal job was a fire use module leader at the park here. A uh, few th kind of quick orientation things. You, you can actually now see the top of Sierra Grande up there. Um, and then pretty much the burn, burn pretty much follows that ridge line down, goes up to the top of this hill and then kind of heads down, eventually ties in with the road that direction. On this side, you could, if you're in the right place, you can see the saddle over there. I don't know how much Ed or Matt talked about that, but you can see the saddle over there, it goes up to another ridge and then drops back down pretty close to where Matt was down there. We conducted that briefing about seven o'clock that, e that evening. After the briefing, uh, Al King called the National Weather Service on his cell phone and just confirmed that their spot forecast was still uh, looking good and pretty much the weather service confirmed that it was still you know looking good um, At that point in time we did start a test burn It was about 20 after 7 when we actually started the test burn uh, the fuels at the very top of this hill were pretty light uh, and uh, To me it wasn't real representative of what we're going to be burning in so we actually continued the test burn for quite a ways and it took a fair amount of time we uh, actually stopped the test burn about eight o'clock at night, but we stopped it once we got to see fire behavior and fields that we felt were representative of the entire area. As we worked down, uh, it took a while, like I say, this, this is not a short distance clear across that thing. Um, eventually they got up there, uh, they swatted out the little piece that needed to be swatted out, and they started ignition down into the saddle. Um, as they're bringing it down to the saddle, there's still, I think there's just four people left on this far side. Um, they're continuing ignition, you know, at a quite a bit slower rate, uh, pretty much taking really small chunks, but they're still continuing ignition at that point in time. Um, I pretty much stayed with the ignition down into the saddle, like I say, down into there for a ways. And at one point in time, the people on the east side, they called up and said, hey, we're going to stop ignition. Uh, pretty much what ended up happening, the winds were generally out of the northwest up here. And as actually you could start, if you look at you, how things work, as you start turning around this corner, the winds will actually start pushing actually towards the line out there. So they pretty much stopped ignition at that point in time. Uh, and I decided to go back and see what was actually happening over there. I remember Ed Hyatt, he asked one of the Black Mesa crew members uh, probably three different times to do something for him. And that guy was sitting on the ground and, you know, he, he was just very slow to respond. And it was at that point in time I said, hey, I'm going to send these guys off the hill and we're going to keep the Park Service people out here for the night. Um, they were still igniting down into the saddle at that point in time. Uh, that was about midnight when I made that decision. Uh, as pretty much the people on this east side were still, they were sent down the hill pretty much at that point in time. A few Park Service people were sent down with them so that we'd have some people up there, so at least some Park Service people rested for the following day. Had you had the opportunity to work with that crew and uh, with prescribed fire operations? Uh, prior not that crew we actually used some black mesa crews uh, on the previous burn we did a couple weeks earlier mm -hmm. um, and they are actually really outstanding crews um, but they had sent crews someplace north and pretty much we are down to the last 10 people they had from the way i understood it the people down on this side they're still doing ignition down into that saddle about two o'clock that at that night 
they had completed their ignition and released a black mace of people down to the road. It was at that point in time that I actually left the unit and I went down to go order resources. Uh, went down to my office, I called up dispatch and said, hey, I need a crew for our burn. Their initial response was, you need a type one or a type two crew? And I said, yeah, a type two crew would do us. And they said, well, I'm gonna have to talk with my supervisory dispatcher about that. And I said, well, can we talk with him? And he goes, well, he doesn't come on till eight in the morning. At, the, at that point in time, I was pretty much boiling. I did get hold of the engine crew here at Bandelier and had those guys, they're supposed to be reporting out here at six o'clock in the morning, the next morning. Um, at that point in time, I called up the people back here on the unit, pretty much let them know what was happening and told them that I was gonna get some sleep so I could be available in the morning. Um, I went down to, went to sleep and uh, six o'clock in the morning, Paul Gleason comes in, starts waking me up and I, I'm pretty dang drowsy at this point in time too. He goes, hey, and he says, hey, it's backing down the unit, backing down into the unit, you know, pretty much quite a ways. We need to do something. And he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, well, what have you done? And it's like, and I start telling him what's happening and, and, and he's like, okay, well, we need to do something. He says, okay. So I get up, uh, I call dispatch again. Um, phone rang 10 times and I actually didn't get a single, didn't get an answer out of it. Uh, at that point in time, Paul suggested, okay, we need to start calling people. Uh, call the superintendent, call the, some of the regional fire staff, you know, just start letting people know what's happening out here. So we started making those phone calls. Uh, about seven o'clock, I decided to call dispatch again uh, and uh, did get the supervisory dispatcher that time, let him know what was happening. And at that point in time, Paul said, hey, we need a type one crew in a helicopter. And personally, it sounded like gravy to me. It's like, yeah, if we could get that. I had some doubts whether we, we could get it after the first dispatch experience, but uh, um, called dispatch again, talked with the supervisory dispatcher, said, we need a type one crew in a helicopter. He said, well, are you declaring this wildland fire? And I said, no, we're not. And then he asked why and I explained, hey, it's still within prescription, still within the unit. We're not having problems. We just need the resources to make sure that we can deal with what we got out there. So your initial thought to, uh, at 3.30 in the morning to start ordering some resources, was that because you had had to send down the Black Mesa crew and yes. so your kind of your nighttime plan was, was not going quite the way you wanted it to? <coughs> yes. Okay. I'd talk with dispatch. They were questioning whether I was questioning my resource orders. Um, they called up Al King on the burn unit and pretty much asked him. And the way I understand it is that Al pretty much gave him the same information I did. If we wanted those resources, wanted those resources. We were not declaring it a wildland fire, and but we did want those resources. Uh, dispatch called me. It seemed to me it didn't take very long from my conversation till when they called me back, probably 15, 20 minutes. They called me back and said the resources were coming and they should be there by nine o'clock. Uh, and then, of course, they Santa Fe hotshots and helicopter 30 something. I can't tell you exactly what they were anymore. Uh, but uh, those resources were in route at that point in time is what they're pretty much saying. Um, at that point in time, we went up to TA-49 and started talking with the fire, finding out what's happening. I believe it's around 10 o'clock, Ed called and said he was having problems or had an escape on this side. About that same time, the helicopter did start arriving. Uh, and uh, they landed on the ground and were doing their hell attack stuff. And, and uh, we we're talking with them about what's happening, about the recent escape and everything and kind of got them lined out to some extent. And Paul came up to me and said, hey, Mike, why don't you go get some sleep and let me take this over? And I said, okay, it sounds okay with me. So at the point where um, Paul took it, were you guys, were you um, getting uncomfortable with things or were you, were well, you considering conversion? Well, the escape conversion? had happened. The escape had happened at that point? Yeah. Okay, and then was that significant enough that you were considering conversion? I don't think I was in reality. Um, you know, part of the information from Ed that was coming down is like, yeah, I think we got it. No, then the next thing would be, no, we don't got it. And another one, oh, I think we got it again. So it was kind of hit or miss. So things were fairly uncertain at that point. Yeah. 
Mike, had, had you guys worked with dispatch to ordering resources uh, for support to prescribe fire before or only in support to suppression? So, so, so we, it's, it's very interesting. Yes, we had worked with them with prescribed fire. Um, there were problems. And, and uh, not, I don't believe it's just within this zone. Uh, I think within this region, I believe there's problems with ordering resources for prescribed fires. And, you know, when I was with the fire use module, you know, as all prescribed fires and, you know, it's like it's all this constant hassle is like, you know, where's this resource or blah, blah, blah. And of course, we know like, you know, three days before it's coming. And, you know, it's like, hey, we're tell people, hey, we're expecting things. And and then the other side is saying, yeah, we sent it, and then people are trying to track things down, but there was, there was always problems. Mike, could you describe the fire behavior again? I mean, just what it was like? It, it's generally low. Like I say, at average flame lengths are probably about a foot and a half. Um, the, you know, you'd see three foot flame lengths occasionally. Um, occasionally we were getting trees torching. Uh, Spot fires? No, um, no control problems. You know, like I say, is, the swatting and spraying with the backpack yeah. pumps worked really well. Yeah. So, and you know, you know, as you, ha you have people lined out, you know, it's like a lot of times the last few people aren't doing much. Occasionally they'd have to do something, but they weren't running back, you know, a hundred yards to chase spot fire or things that kicked up again. So the next day, if I understood, you got a helicopter coming in and another crew, right? Yeah. And so how many total people are on the hill holding them? At this point in time, there's one, two on this side, and I think there's four on this side. So there's six people up on the hill. Uh, the two people from the engine crew arrived, so there are eight, and there's going to be an additional 20. You know, working around in your wildest imaginings, could you have ever seen this thing blowing up and making its way to uh, Los Alamos? Did that even cross your mind, do you remember? You know, it did not. Yeah, you know, a lot of it, too. Like, you know, we were collecting fuel samples here. To me, it's like, and you could look at weather stations and they kind of give you an idea, but we're collecting on-site samples and collecting a decent number of them. Um, you know, I, I look at this hillside here and, you know, this is a southwest facing hill. The other side's northeast facing. You know, it's like, it, it really it was not in my wildest imagination. So at about 0, 0700, um, we're up moving around, we're watching fire, and and we knew uh, we knew that the engine 91 crew was going to be coming up to help us that day. What I was starting to see up there was that this this fire was backing down as it should have, just backing down pretty slow. But my worry up in here was that I was going to start to get hooked on my holding assignment up here and um, I made a call on the radio to the folks on the other side and Al was over there and my suggestion was let's just take fire a few feet at a time is what it amounted to um, and just keep it even as it backed down the hill. At around 10 hundred or so you know give or take um, Right down in the middle of this, this is a, there's a little bit of a saddle in this that you can't tell, but there's kind of a depression that sometimes has water in it, and we were just taking a break there. We were just, you know, fire was doing fine. We were uh, doing as, as fire folks will do sometimes and have a little bit of a break. Um, and a couple chains up in here, I could see flames that were maybe an inch or two high. I mean barely enough that was visible but it was right in that area where we had black lined and it was starting to creep out into this grass out here um, and you know it was one of those things where like that I was up I was running um, grabbing a bladder bag and you know this hauling butt to to get up there um, by the time I did get up there it was you know a few feet across um, spraying at it and it's flaring up and um, 
starting to move a little bit and it's in that little bit higher grass and that just created a little bit of a control problem for us. Um, so we continued working on that for a while and it's gradually, it's getting bigger and bigger and it's probably up to an a, a half acre um, or so. And, and I called Al and said, hey, we've got a slop that we just cannot hang on to. I'm, I need some help. I need, you know, and it was something like, well, what kind of help? And I like, I need a helicopter and a bucket would be best, you know, and we need them now. Um, so that, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. Um, we were, uh, we started using regular hand tools and they weren't really effective in the grass. Um, we found a great big fir tree up there and, and just cut boughs off it and we would beat those things until there was nothing left on them until it was just a stick, you know, and that's what we did for quite a while. And then the helicopter arrived up to Bandelier. Um, and what I wanted was a helicopter and a bucket. And so what we needed was we needed some water up there. Um, but what ended up happening with that is the helicopter came up with two crew members and a manager on board. And they dropped the two crew members off right here in this meadow. And it was like, hey, I need water. I don't need the crew members. I need the water. But I'll take them. I mean, they're here. I'm not going to get rid of them at that point. So I put them to work on this. Uh, east side, they're putting in some line and trying to, you know, they anchored in and, and we're moving along. Um, helicopter lifted off with the manager. They went, it took them a while, but they found a water source out in the Baca, just a mile or so um, away. So that's, you know, there's another one of those little small pieces in the puzzle that was being delayed as we needed the water and they needed all these other things. But. So they got the water, they got the manager out, they got a bucket on board, and they started making drops. And the drops were doing pretty good. But, you know, imagine a Type 3 helicopter with a small bucket that's already been cinched down to, for flying at 10,000 feet. The, where the drops were hitting was effective, but by the time you get back with the next bucket, things were heated up again. So, um, we, we were making a little bit of progress, but at the same time, we were we were getting beat. I mean, I'd I'd spent a lot of hours up and had already been working on these spot, this spot or slop over for quite a while. So that takes us up to about 11 o'clock. Um, you know, with our burning, uh, having the slop, the helicopter coming in, the two crew members um, getting the bucket drops. Um, and about 11 o'clock, um, the shot crew, I believe, was getting parked and getting ready to hike up here. Um, so we're, you know, we're feeling pretty good. We've got, you know, guys we all know, the crew just down the road, they're going to come up and help us out, and, and, uh, things are looking all right. Um, so we, you know, in between 11 and about, uh, 12 quarter to 12 something like that between the crew got up there we just continued on trying to catch this little slop over and some places we were doing pretty good and some places we were just leaving it alone because we weren't effective at it could could you refresh me what the contingency resources were identified as and then i've got a follow-up to that a helicopter an air tanker and i think two crews was the daytime contingency and that, and that was for phase one or the entire unit, the entire burn, right. that was a contingency for mm -hmm. the entire plan. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the trigger for that, for the contingency resources, was basically the release of the Black Mesa crew. And at that point, Mike's whole rotation, everything that he had worked out as far as crews to hold for the night, people to come back during the next day operational period, that's where that kind of needed some readjustment and so that's why we needed the contingency resources to bump in for the next day's peak burning period. The fire behavior and I mean it was kind of tracking within that you had a pretty wide prescription right I mean it looked like there was a fair amount of leeway and it was all within that no bells were going off in your head other than maybe the lack of resources to hold 
the, you know, the, the, it wasn't so much an alarm bell, but certainly it was very paramount in my mind whenever we released Black Mesa and knew that Mike's crew rotation had gotten kind of fouled up because of that, that we were going to have to have additional resources to hold during the burn period. But it seemed like with him going down, we had a contingency resources in place, etc. We thought that that was all going to go pretty smoothly, get those uh, guys out here and up on the hill by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock when things started heating up. Again, at 10 o'clock, had the call from Ed that they had to the slop over out there, needed the resources. We knew that the, the Sandia ship was, was inbound, checked back with dispatch again. They said their ETA should be eminent. So it sounded like they were going to be here. There was some discussion of, well, we need a helicopter with bucket. In four years of thinking back to it all, I don't know if someone specifically, what, what their specific request, you know, what they heard on their side as far as, okay, do we need a helicopter with bucket or do we need to come up there with the bucket ready to go? Not, not sure. But anyways, helicopter arrived. There were some issues initially with dip sites. Had to work through that with Santa Fe Dispatch and Atlanta EOC to make sure we could get the dip site squared away. Got that squared away. They started dropping water. Uh, the reports I was hearing from Ed on the radio was, uh, it was kind of inter intermittent. That, oh, it doesn't sound very good. Next time, well, it looks like we're making some good progress. Things are looking pretty good. And then the shots arrived at about 11.10 is what I had logged in. They arrived down here on the road. And we had also, the uh, Park Service resources that Mike had released the evening before to go down the hill and get some rest. We also had those folks come back up with the shock crew to supplement those people and to make sure they could get into where they needed to get to. We didn't want to have further delays of them not knowing which trail to take up or whatever. So I had the Park Service folks come back up. Majority of the folks went over to the east side, had one squad come over to the west side. So we were getting pretty late in our, our tour of duty needed uh, to get swapped out. And then also the, the rest of the unit, well, we had uh, checked on that once earlier in the morning. We needed to have somebody over on this side just to keep an eye on the rest of that unit so there wouldn't be any other slop overs or, or concerns. And uh, then around 1,300 hours, got a radio call from the shot superintendent saying, I guess it was, well, why don't you point about where it was because you know where exactly where they were where? About 1,300 where they started running into problems in order to... At that time when the shots showed up and things, your resource, who was the incident commander? Of At that point, it was, it was not a declared and escape prescribed fire. It was still being managed as a prescribed fire. We thought we could catch this slop over within the burn unit perimeters, catch it, contain it, and continue on with business. So Paul Gleason was the burn boss. Oh, okay. And so I was serving as a burn board. boss. I'm sorry, yeah. I used the wrong term. So, so again, sir, oh, go ahead. Um, I actually met and briefed the, the shot crew um, right about in here. This meadow actually kind of continued down in along this line, and you can see this line in here. So that's where I briefed them, and that's where they anchored in. So anyway, it's 1,300 hours while the shots were trying to get hooked around that. I got a call from them advising that the fire had gotten into the trees, was torching out, starting to move through the crowns, and they were requ requesting an air tanker. About the same time, uh, there was also an uh, aerial recon that was up that the Forest Service had launched for detection and to just, you know, see what's going on up here and talk with the aerial observer and they confirmed, yeah, looks like you guys are going to need to have some mud on this thing. So we called down to Gleason and Paul was right there with the agency administrator rep and the three of us jointly decided that this was our trigger point, that this thing's no longer in prescription. We're going to have to call it escape and let's get the air tankers ordered. So that's what we did, and then I guess the, the sort of the, the story after that was with the air tanker drops and the shock crew, they did contain that slop over at about 30 acres by the evening, that would be Friday evening, at 30 acres and there was a one acre spot on the forest, the rest was all on the park. And, but again, you know, for the staff ride, that's basically the end of the story because we had declared it at that point.
two or three quick items. Number one, that, that whole thing w was a very professional effort, and it was based on logic and professional, professional rationale. And I think in, in terms of what happened, it was easy to see myself having been a part of that. Either had I been there to be a part of it, or looking back over my own personal history to say I was a part of something <clears throat> similar. Also, just a couple of things to repeat. Um, I also could see myself in, in, those, uh, in that same position and uh, appreciate the folks uh, uh, coming out and talking with us about it. I also was struck by the fact that it, it is hard sometimes to look back because some of the changes or some of the issues that we deal with today are a result of Sarah Grande, and we may not, uh, you know, in some of those cases, we may not have the same issue today because we have made some changes institutionally. I'll tell you, I've, I just, a lot of respect for what y'all do. And again, coming from the uh, wonderland of uh, local government, and uh, I mean, I work for LA County. You know, to, uh, you were saying, I think at one point there was like 130 some people on the fire. We called for a first alarm brush, we got 141. You know, so it it's, it kind of boggles the mind the kind of work that you try to accomplish, or that you do accomplish. I mean, uh, again, you all talked about uh, 2,000 acres that you had burned already successfully, with the limited resources you have, and uh, I walk away with a great admiration for you. And I congratulate you. I think the most pivotal thing for me at the beginning of the staff rise when Al King just said, uh, really with all his heart, how. Um, how tough it was for he and, and Matt and the others to come back and for for the fact that uh, they were doing it just so um, they would hope to help any of us in this room for preventing to go through what they went through and, and that kind of took me through the rest of the stations. Um, I was burning in a park, um, a park in the southwest, um, same time periods as, as Bandler was doing their thing and I, through all those stations, I could definitely see myself in, in the same uh, shoes as, as all those folks had, had been in, so I really appreciate that personally. I'm looking at this crew that had the willingness to come back here and talk to us yesterday and, uh, you know, when Al King kicked it off, you know, there was partly being responsible for organizing this thing, there's always the nervousness, is it going to go right? And, and two sentences out of Al's mouth, and then through the rest of the day, it was obvious it was working. But what, what the feeling I had was the incredible uh, feeling of pride to be even shoulder to shoulder with a group of people that were willing to come back, having the courage to come back and talk to this. And just knowing what you guys must have went through without asking you to know that, you know, in a way you were responsible for lighting a burn that was ripping into one of the largest nuclear facilities in the United States, you know, had burned homes. I, I can't imagine that feeling. So, you know, just doubly em emphasized for me that your courage in coming back was just, just outstanding. It sends shivers up my spine to know that I work with people that are this professional. I knew a little bit more about um, about Sierra Grande um, than I guess the average Joe because I was on uh, one of the Type One teams that helped put it out. Um, I learned yesterday a little bit more, and I think um, maybe we need to find a way to set the record straight because what I know and what the report says are two different things. And I think um, maybe uh, lessons learned might have a role in that. It's been my experience with other staff rides um, where we still have folks that had been involved that come to the site <clears throat> and present their perspective. Two things, we have to be very careful how we formulate our opinions and perceptions based on reports. Um, those reports those reports are instigated under a different concept than how we look at them um, as professionals, and so it, it would affect it would it has affected my perceptions, and then how I carry that perception into doing into doing my own job. I think the whole investigation process needs to be revisited because I think we all know escapes are going to continue to happen, 
and hopefully not on this scale, but I'd like to think that some higher ups are maybe planning ahead and thinking, how are we gonna do this? And how are we gonna um, protect our employees and not abandon them? There are a couple of folks who had the courage to stand up and back and support folks uh, taking care of their people, making sure that political processes didn't run roughshod over people that were trying to do uh, the right thing. Uh, people like Tim Sexton uh, stood up and put their careers on the line. And so there are leaders among us that have courage and, and have the right stuff. Uh, and they're present with us. Some of the leadership that we wish would be more involved, more visible, providing psychological safety to uh, folks is waiting, I think, for something from the field to tell them that this is important. This workshop has the opportunity to provide a lot of that impetus uh, to them and make it clearly a message that they would be then willing to listen to. Based upon what we heard yesterday in the reading before the class, I picked up on something that I think is a significant systemic failure on our parts, um, and that's the dispatch organization and their response to the burn boss. I've dealt with this myself several times um, where I work, and it is not the responsibility of the dispatch organization to determine whether or not resources are needed or how they will be paid. That's a question that's up to the agency administrators and budget and fiscal folks that burn boss should have been responded to immediately and should have had the resources that they need. Whether or not it's a prescribed burn is irrelevant. What was relevant was that there was fire over a ridge from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And having to check with one supervisor in that situation is a time lag that isn't necessary. And I think that's a main thing I'll take back with me. But I do think the folks conducting the prescribed burn did everything that they could and I probably would have made the same decision. I'm a local government fire chief and we do micro burning, meaning that we do it on a small, small scale. We burn in small increments next to homes, of course, but we staff it with, you know, three to four times the staff and what we're seeing with you guys. I think you need to take a look at it from a risk management point of view and take a look at how you're staffing, what your contingencies are, and are they in place to do the job. I don't know how you guys do this. I mean, I wouldn't have... You know, we wouldn't, Norb and I were looking at it that way. We, we wouldn't start this thing. We were, you know, we would need 10 to 15 the amount of people. Now, that's standard local government attitude, I know. Understand my bias, but at the same token, I think there's some merit to that, and there's something you should take a look at is how you're staffing, what your contingencies are, and are they truly in place, and is there truly enough folks on the ground to do the right job? Something that struck me really hard yesterday, and I think it's still a huge problem for us, is the concept of contingency. Um, we had a big rug yanked out from under us with the air tankers and how many of us have written burn plans where that's the contingency to load and run retardant of some sort, whether that be a helicopter or an air tanker. And I go, where are we going to go? Um, what is our contingency? And it keeps coming back to that very same discussion is, uh, you know, LA County can call and get a first alarm and get 144 people. We were asking for one hand crew. Um, where are our contingencies and what are they going to be here in the future? And how are we going to play this game out with the dispatches? I'm really concerned about that. I'm reminded, was reminded again yesterday of the inadequacy of the national prescribed fire curriculum. Um, it's, it needs to be adjusted, needs to be overhauled. 
I don't think that it addresses landscape scale burning at all. And I think there's some major things in there that we need to deal with. Again, um, the policy, we need to develop a policy uh, to protect our employees during uh, periods of time when we have uh, an incident like this. We need to protect them from the time the problem occurs through the end of a, an investigation uh, to attempt to minimize the amount of influence politics may have uh, and ensure a just decision is made on employee welfare. What I came away with was I would have implemented that burn also if I was a burn boss. Operationally, yes, I would have done things different. And what I saw was a difficulty to analyze risk. And everything we do is how we look at risk, what, how much w risk we're willing to take, why we'll take that risk. And it's very difficult for us to get a true handle on what the risks that we're taking are. And then why are we out there taking that risk? What reward do we get? What benefit besides that it's just our job to do this? So yeah, I would have taken that risk, yes, because I'm a risk taker, um, as most people probably in this room are. And yet our agency now, we don't reward people for taking the risk. We always come back and look at when there was a problem. And we don't come out and look at the good successes. How many workshops do we have to see, geez, they accomplished 200,000 acres. They did good. No, we'll come out and we'll look at the problems. So uh, I think we need to change a little bit and start rewarding people for taking the risk and even when the circumstances go bad. Uh, I think sometimes um, with the situations that we are dealt with, uh, I'm talking here about the the shape of the ecosystem and the landscape, how um, we have a lot of condition class three that we're trying to do something with. Um, a tendency for a lot of agencies, mine included, is to go out there and fix everything right away. And I think there's a political emphasis there also. I don't think that that's quite the thing to do. Uh, if you have us, an area that is supposed to burn, uh, for instance, once every five, 10 years, hasn't had any fire in it for 100 years. You try to go out and meet all your objectives and turn it back into that five, 10 year fire return cycle all in one burn. I don't know if we're doing the ecosystem right. I don't know if we're doing our personnel right, asking them to do that. I think um, trying to meet uh, all your objectives all at once might be something you need to reconsider. From a lessons learned perspective, it was very interesting because I had folks come up to me that were in our group that said, of all the different lessons learned that this, this type of thing, a staff ride like this, was the, the best way for them to learn. And thinking about this last night and, and, and today, I'd like to pass on a couple other impressions that I, that I had. And one of the things is that I really felt yesterday went well. It went better than, you know, when, as you prepare for something like this, you kind of go through various scenarios in your mind. And it exceeded my best case scenario of how it yesterday would have gone. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. And I think uh, some of the reason for that success are the participants, the rest of the folks that are in this room. You guys were really engaged. There was no doubt about that. You asked good questions. The focus was on learning lessons. And there was good dialogue. And I really appreciate that because I know for myself, I felt very comfortable with you. So thanks for that. I really appreciate that. It was mentioned yesterday by one of the presenters. Uh, they were thankful they had an opportunity to tell their side of it. And, and certainly considering all the liability that is surrounding these folks uh, and their agencies, it's understandable not to want to say a lot, but uh, it's important it's important to them and it's important to us as a profession to hear their side of it and to present it in a form where they can feel safe to be able to do that.